in a little more than a month from now, in February. And I, I can feel it. It's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm going to be telling Asian American Filipino history. Like, you know, I, some of you know me from my, my writing on the ALDEF blog and essays I do there, Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Also at, you know, the, the Philippine the Inquirer at inquirer.net. Some other websites, you know, Google me, you'll see I, I've written for SF Gate a long time ago. See all my old stuff going back to like 2000. And, you know, I've, I've taken my essays and I put them together in a narrative comic one man show. And I am, I'm just acting like a, a, uh, you know, a horse just sort of waiting. Well, you know, I don't really like horse racing anymore, but I, I can't think of a, another analogy except horse racing. I'm like in the barn, ready to get out, which, which is why I do these shows. I do these shows because I can express myself on a daily basis, but, but the fringe, I'm, I'm coming to the New York city uh, fringe. It's called the frigid fringe. You know, the fringe that they're part of this whole, it's a global network of artists who are just looking for a place to play. And it's kind of an offshoot of the big fringe, the fringe movement, which started in Edinburgh in Scotland and then spread to North America and all the English speaking uh, uh, countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, it, it's exciting, the, the French, because it's theater, it's comedy, it's one man show, it's drama, it's musical, it's all sorts of things at, at a fringe festival. Sometimes drag. I mean, I've become an aficionado of uh, drag. Well, not an aficionado. I, I've seen a number of drag shows. I appreciate them. That's an art form. And, you know, especially if you're from San Francisco drag shows have been kind of like uh, ever going back to Charles Pierce. Anyway, so my show at the New York City Frigid Fringe is called Emil Amok, Lost NPR Host Found Under St. Mark's. And uh, it's coming February 16th, of course, Under St. Mark's Theater there in the Lower East Side. And I'm going to put stuff on my website, to, like all the exact dates, February 16th, February 18th, February 23rd at 6.30 p.m. If you want a nooner, Saturday, 20, the, February 25th at 12.20 p.m., a nooner. Yeah, of course. Uh, Sunday, February 26th at 7 p.m., Friday, March 3rd at 8.10 p.m., and then Saturday, March 4th at 10.20 p.m. So seven shows I'm doing. It should be fun. I would see all of them because all of them are going to be different. I might break into song at one, say, Hey, look, I'm going to make this karaoke night at Emil Amok. No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that because, you know, people are paying tickets, people are buying tickets for this. And, um, and if you can't make it there live in New York City, I will show you a link on my site, amok.com, show you a link to get to the frigid fringe and you can see the show from wherever you are hawaii philippines wherever, you know mongolia wherever anyway that's coming up it's exciting the frigid fringe featuring a show of mine well it's not feet well yeah it's presented as part of the frigid fringe Emil Amok, lost NPR host, found under St. Mark's, February 16th. Look for it. I'm just, uh, I'm just excited uh, that uh, I think it's going to, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I got the wipe going on here now. Welcome to our program. It's uh, Emil Amok, my, Emil Amok's takeout. This is called the takeout. My takes on all things considerable. We uh, kind of, uh, Subtitle of the show, W-D-A-A-A-T. What does an Asian American think? Because I call this the 
Micro talks you of the AAPI and the AAXs. And if you're neither of those, you can be an ALL, all's the rest of you. It's kind of interesting today because today, if you didn't know it, it's Korean American Day. Did you know that? I, I got a release from, here's a congressman who's not waiting around wondering when He's not waiting around wondering when George Santos is going to quit. Here's Congressman Jimmy Gomez of California's 34th. He got together with uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu of California 27, the chairwoman of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. And also, she's, she's a Democrat, by the way. And she got together with a Republican. So it's kind of bipartisan. Young Kim, California 39. And they're reintroducing a resolution celebrating Korean American Day, K.A. Day. Did you think that K.A. was kick-ass day? Well, it could be. Korean American Day, which marks this year the 120th anniversary of the arrival of the first Korean immigrants to the U.S. on January 13th, 1903. The first Korean immigrants to the U.S., Imagine that, 1903. And they're also, they're having a big uh, big party down there in Koreatown right now in L.A. And uh, let's see, what does uh, Congressman Woman Chu says? She says, Korean Americans have called the U.S. home for 120 years as we recognize Korean American Day today, I remain, as always, proud to stand alongside the Korean American community. Okay. Thank you, Judy. That's, she's a, she's a, a Democrat. The Republican, Young Kim, says, since the first Korean immigrants arrived on January 13, 1903, Korean Americans have made their mark from sea to shining sea. Okay, kind of cliche. And have found success in the classroom the workplace, and even right here in Congress to make our nation a better place. She says, I'm grateful for the sacrifices my family made to have the chance at a better life and proud to recognize the 1.8 million Korean Americans in the U.S. today who share my story. You know, and, and that's kind of important, you know, because we're going to talk, because we talk, talk about stories, we talk about Asian American stories, and when I saw that this was Korean American Day today, I said, what a perfect day to honor, or not honor, but to once again talk about Robert Her. Her? Who he? You know, Robert Her. He's in all the newspapers. You're still reading newspapers, aren't you? He's in all the news. He, he's the guy. He's the special prosecutor. Now, sometimes people say, the independent prosecutor, well, he's independent of the Justice Department, but he's a special prosecutor. The official name is Special Prosecutor. And he was appointed by the by Merrick Garland of the Justice Department to look at the mishandling of those Biden documents. And, you know, the bad thing is he's not going to have enough work. He's not. <laughs> the guy's not going to have enough work because how many documents a couple dozen, no, like a handful of documents so far. They might they might find more. But that's Robert Hur's job. And if you you look at Robert Hur's face, I mean, Korean American face. That guy's serious. He's a serious guy. No nonsense. Here's what I like about Robert Hur. He is not going to be hung up by politics. You know, and yet there's a lot of people on the right. They look at Robert Hur. I call him the AAPI person of the hour. You go to my column at the ALDEF blog. A L A A L D E F dot org slash blog. I call him AAI, AAPI uh, person of the hour. Maybe for the next couple of years. Because you know there are Fox News Republicans drooling over any potential Biden misstep. You know. And her is going to be seen as the as the go to guy as they seek to bury the president. And I feel sorry for them because I don't think he's going to find a lot. And when he finds nothing, 
He's going to be truthful. And that is what we need in this country right now. And there he is. I mean, look, Merrick Garland, the attorney general, really had no choice to, but to appoint this special counsel to investigate the handling of classified documents found at the former office of President Biden, as well as the president's Delaware home. And you know they were going to get into this. You, you just know, I mean, you could see it in the news today. Boy, you know, I, I feel for, uh, I guess they call her KJP, Karine Jean-Pierre. She's the press secretary for Biden, African-American woman. And having been a press secretary, you know, it's it's actually an easy job if you don't say anything. It's an, <laughs> it's an easy job if you know, I can't answer that question, but I'll get you to someone who can. Now, she did that a lot today when people asked about the darn documents, but she's repeating herself because reporters have no other news. And all they can do instead of digging around trying to find news is they can ask the official source who is Karine Jean-Pierre, KJP, and what you're going to tell them. Can't tell you. She's, it's not stonewalling, but she's answering the same thing all the time. And she's just simply referring reporters to, to the people who appropriately can answer the question. So it looks like she's deflecting, looks like she's declining. And people are saying, oh, well, Biden on the defensive, this is bad, bad look, but you know, this is actually pretty good. You know, if this is the worst it gets for Biden, pretty good. Because believe me, it's worse for Donald Trump. He's got another special counsel because his situation is going to be a lot worse. You know, so back to her. We'll talk about Trump in a sec. But her appears to be a straight shooter. Leaves his politics at the door. Politics is irrelevant. He's all facts, no fluff. Here's his story on K.A. Day. Born to South Korean immigrants in New York. Her, 49, went to Harvard. Harvard College. Much younger than me, just 49. Stanford Law. Clerked for Supreme Court Justice William H. Rehnquist. So, you know, smart, conservative. And based on his resume unabashedly even-handed. And that's what it appears. You know, his duty is to get at the truth for the American people. He doesn't work for Republicans, doesn't work for Democrats. He's trying to get at the truth. He's done it as a U.S. attorney, working in Maryland, leading the U.S. Attorney's Office. He did everything, drugs, fraud, violent crime. I mentioned he went, went after a white supremacist group called the base yesterday. And these are some bad dudes, the base. They, he, they were out to kill, they were out to kill leftists. Politicians, journalists, professors, you name it. So I think that Robert Herr is the Asian American man of the hour. I mean, we need a guy like him. Here's what he said. I will conduct the assigned investigation with fair, impartial, and dispassionate judgment. I intend to follow the facts swiftly and thoroughly without fear or favor and will honor the trust placed in me to perform the service. That's a, you know, that's who you want in charge of this. Now, like I said, he's probably going to be become as famous as Robert Mueller, right? Because they're, they're going to, Fox News, at, at the very least, they're going to say, well, what did Robert Herr find? Is Robert Herr going to come close? And we're going to hear his name on the conservative side. And also, you'll hear it on the other, other uh, mainstream news sources because people want to know. But what we do know is right now, her has the easier job than his counterpart, special counsel investigating the Trump Mar-a-Lago case, Jack Smith, because hers dealing with fewer documents. Biden is fully cooperating. 
I mean, you know, here's the thing about KJP, the, the press secretary. She may seem like she's declining to, to say the truth. She's just watching what she says because she can't be as open when she's speaking for the president. So I just find it interesting that I hear the press moaning about, oh, they're not cooperating. No, no, they're not telling you stuff. They're not trying. They're not engaging in a game of gotcha because Robert Hur is on the case and he's going to find stuff. He or he's going to if the, if it's there. So, yeah, the Biden folks are they're cooperating. Trump, on the other hand, uh, he was on social media yesterday calling his special counsel Jack Smith, a terrorist and a Trump hater, because that's the mindset of Donald Trump. But on the Biden case, we have Robert Hur, and the country will see an Asian American face representing the search for what should be democracy's common ground, truth and justice. This is, I mean, you know, we often find ourselves in arguments about, you know, what's the truth? No. One side said this, the other side says that. Already, you see the Republicans lining up in the House to say taking cracks at at at, at Joe Biden situation. I think Jim Jordan setting up a, a committee now. But Robert Hur for the Justice Department, he's the guy to look for. I think he's the guy you can trust because there's nothing political about what he's going to do. Is going to get to truth and justice. That's our common ground in this democracy. And it's what America needs right now. So, you know, it's MLK weekend. I mentioned Kihui, Kihui Kwan. I, I, I got to get his name right. I've heard it pronounced Kihi, Kihui, Ki, Kihi Kwan, right? Uh, and we talked about his Golden Globe speech. He won for supporting actor uh, for everything, everywhere, all at once, which the cognizance, he liked to say, E-E-A-A-O. Yeah. Did you check out E-E-A-A-O? Oh, what, are you singing Old MacDonald now? What? No, E-E-A-A-O. Uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. That's, that's the code, the new code. E-E-A-A-O. So, uh, first of all, you know, I grew up in San Francisco and I had a pal named Waymond. Waymond, the name of Quan's character in E-E-A-A-O. And it's and the family of another neighborhood buddy, because I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, the Mission, San Francisco. Another neighborhood buddy, Albert, his family ran a wash and fold. And I saw them all in, uh, in Kwan. Kihi Kwan, who played an Asian American everyman who you root for to win, right? This is what you don't get in movies. And when he won, as he did this week, his remarks at the Globes captured the emotions of dreams finally fulfilled here is a guy see the speech you know he thought that was it temple of doom he got plucked plucked out by uh steven spielberg gave him an opportunity and he thought that's it i'm never it's never gonna happen again and you know he was in the goonies but he wasn't in anything else for decades Guy's 51 now. And when it finally happened that he got the call from the Daniels, he did the work, he won a globe. You can watch his speech. Go to uh, the Aldef blog. I got a link there. But Quan in the speech says, you know, he vowed to never forget where he came from. And in showbiz terms, that would be like, okay, never forgetting that you were discovered as a child by Steven Spielberg. It's great. But geo-historically, never forgetting where you come from, if you're Kihi Kwan, it means Saigon, Vietnam, where Kwan was born in 1971. Okay, what 
71. Vietnam era. Vietnam War era. And his family became refugees in 1978. I mean, his parents were there all throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s. But they became refugees in 78. And here was his saga. His father and five siblings went to Hong Kong to a refugee camp there. And at the same time, his mother and three other siblings went to Malaysia. And I, you know, the map of Asia, right? Malaysia is down. <laughs> Hong Kong is, you know, the other way. I mean, that, that's a split there. They, they, they left in 78. And then in 79, they were all reunited in the U.S. You know, when I was reading that, just doing some research for this, I said, hey, Ki Kwan, he could give a Golden Globe speech for the miracle of his life. I mean, you're a kid. You're, you're, you're a refugee at age seven. You go with your your father and your five siblings to Hong Kong, you're separated from your mother and your three other siblings. And then by the time you're eight, you're all together again in the United States of America. I, I'd say for one life, that's, that's an entire jackpot, right? For just one life. That, that is the Asian American miracle, right? Forget about, meeting Steven Spielberg and getting into a movie and getting into another movie 40 years later, just coming to America, my goodness. So Quan's Vietnam saga, it's, it's for real, right? And we're coming up to MLK weekend. I really think he ought to just think of that story, his story, maybe your story. I mean, I, I, yesterday, I, I, I like like many of you probably thought, well, he is Chinese, but he's he was born in Vietnam, Quan. But I remember because Temple of Doom came out and Goonies. I, I remember reviewing movies like that, or re reviewing that movie at the time when I was at uh, KRON San Francisco, NBC affiliate back then. And I remember seeing him saying, wow, here's this young kid in, in this movie. And I remember them saying he was Vietnamese. But I, I, when that hit me, I said, wow. It's funny because uh, MLK weekend, I'm thinking about MLK. And I'm thinking about a lot of the, the speeches he gave. And I know a lot of people were would gravitate naturally maybe to the I have a dream speech, right? Let me just pay homage to MLK. I'll listen to I have a dream because it's become kind of cliche. But the one I call MLK's Asian American speech was delivered at the Riverside Church in New York City on April 4th, 1967. It's called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. And in the speech, King makes that connection between civil rights and the peace movement. And in my column, I, I just have a little passage. He advocates for the end of the war in Vietnam, which he calls madness. And he says, we must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken, I speak as an American to the leader of my own nation, 
the great initiative in this war is ours, the initiative to stop. It must be ours. I mean, I know when I was just reading the graph, not out loud, but just reading the words, you can almost hear King's voice. I'm not talking about my bad. I'm not trying to imitate it. I'm just trying to read it. But the cadence, it's, it's all there. It's King. And he was speaking of the American people. But he spoke of the Vietnamese too. And what the war was doing to them. Because it is clear to me, King said, that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. So now, decades later, many of those people are here, like Kihi Kwan, his family. They're in the U.S. They're thriving and heard and seen. And so when you remember Dr. King this weekend, Think of his Riverside Church speech. He he delivered it. He didn't realize it. He didn't understand it at the time. I mean, consider there were hardly any Asian Americans in America. I mean, there had been in the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century, until 1924, when they put a quota on Asian Americans at zero, zero percent. That's like not a quota. That's like an iron door. When you have a quota of zero and the quota remained zero until 1965. So when King gave that speech in 67, it was like two years of the a more liberal immigration. And Asian Americans were just in their, their nascent phase. I mean, not anything near the 23 million now. But when King gave that address speaking about Vietnam, 1967, it was his most Asian American speech ever. And that's why we dwell on it today. I mean, I just want to read a few more lines, a few more graphs from it, because, because you, you have to remember that before he came out and, and said this speech, April 4th, 1967, people were quiet. People didn't want to speak out about Vietnam. He says, I come to this magnificent house of worship. He's in the Riverside Church in New York. Because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I am with you in this meeting because I'm in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statement of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart. And I find myself in full accord when I read its opening lines. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. So this is King's coming out as the peace activist, the anti-war activist that he was. And a lot of people doubted why was he doing this? You know, aren't you a preacher? And he says, the more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die 
in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. But we realize that they would never live on the same block in Detroit. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. He's talking about how the poor were sent to war and how they were manipulated to fight a war that they did not believe in. So he's talking about Americans there, but at some point in his speech, he talks about the Vietnamese. He says, As I try to delineate for you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I would have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race or nation or creed is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties, which are broader and deeper than nationalism, which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for victims of our nation, and for those it calls enemy. For no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam, and search within myself for ways to understand and respond to compassion. My mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. I speak now, not of the soldiers of each side, not of the junta in Saigon, but simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades. I think of them too, because it's clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. How many people, when they think of war, think of the enemy or the, the innocent who are grouped in with the enemy? And here's... Here's more of King. The only change came from America as we increased our troop commitments in support of governments, which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without support. All the while the people read our leaflets and received regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us not their fellow Vietnamese, consider us the real enemy. They move sadly and apathetically as we herd them off the land of their fathers into concentration camps where minimal social needs are rarely met. They know they must move or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go, primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas, preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one Viet Cong inflicted injury. So far, we have, mil 
we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. They wander into the towns and see thousands of the children, homeless, without clothes, running in packs on the streets like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. What do the peasants think as we ally ourselves with the landlords and as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform? What do they think as we test our latest weapons on them, just as the Germans tested out new medicine and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the roots of the independent Vietnam we claim to be building is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the unified Buddhist church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon, we have corrupted their women and children and killed their men. What liberators? Now there's little left to build on, save bitterness. Soon the only solid foundations remaining will be found at our military bases and the concrete of the concentration cramps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these, could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. You know, powerful, powerful stuff here. From MLK. Somehow this madness must cease. He says... Before long, they must know that their government has sent them into a struggle among Vietnamese, and the more sophisticated surely realize that we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create hell for the poor. Somehow the madness must cease. We must stop now. And then he goes on to say the demands, right? In order to atone for our sins and errors in Vietnam, we should take the initiative in bringing a halt to this tragic war. I would like to suggest five con concrete things that our government should do immediately to bring the long and difficult process of extricating ourselves from this nightmarish conflict. Number one, end all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Number two, declare a unilateral ceasefire in the hope that such action will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Number three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. Realistically accept the fact, number four, that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiations in any future Vietnam government. And number five, set a date that we will remove all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. So this is the preacher. This is the preacher coming forward and, and telling America with this Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence. This speech given at the Riverside Church in New York City, April 4th, 1967. I've been to the Riverside Church, not for a service, but I can imagine being in there. And Martin Luther King has given this speech. And how, how incredible that must have been. And how mobilizing it, it was for people who believed in peace to get off their butts and do something. So one last couple of graphs. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, 
class and nation is in reality a call for an all embracing and unconditional love for all men. This oft misunderstood and misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force, which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks a door which leads to ultimate reality. The Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hey, he's a preacher. A little bit of scripture. Two more graphs. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to, per, to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faith, faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on we still have a choice today non-violent coexistence or violent co-annihilation we must move past indecision to action we must find new ways to speak for peace in vietnam and justice throughout the developing world a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. So uh, just reading from Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence, uh, Dr. King, April 4th, 1967. Riverside uh, Church, New York City, really my, my favorite speech, and I've heard a number, you know, I, I hadn't discovered this until maybe the last 10 years. Oddly enough, in a journalism class that I was teaching, uh, because... Uh, we were talking about the Kerner Commission report, which is the report that that was uh, summoned uh, to uh, to tell America what was wrong. Why were blacks rioting in the streets? Why? What, what were the inequalities that people weren't seeing in the 60s? They were making them go to the the the, the urban centers of their cities and burning them down. And uh, it's linked to journalism because the Kerner Commission said. The news ought to cover African-Americans and there ought to be African-Americans and people of color. They didn't use that term people of color, but they, they should be in the media. They should. This was the beginning of a need or a call for real ethnic diversity in our mainstream papers, news organizations. And because of that, the Kerner Commission report, you saw real movements in journalism schools to, to recruit people like Connie Chung, Geraldo Rivera, 
Michelle Clark. I mean, on and on. The names of the first journalists of color to, to go to Columbia School of Journalism, be trained mostly in television, and then to go out into the world. That was Geraldo Rivera's role, you know. He's now with Fox. I don't think the aim was to get him to Fox. He did. But, you know, he was on ABC, both local and national for a long time. And then, of course, you know, Connie Chung was part of that whole movement of bringing minority community members into journalism. So it was around that time that I was studying the civil rights movement and the movement of journalism. And then someone turned me on to Martin Luther King's speech at Riverside Church. And oddly enough, it was a guy I later worked with who had been since retired, the late Stan Hope Gould. Because I was somehow ran into him. His, uh, his wife actually was taking a class of mine and said, Stan Hope thinks you should read this speech. And I was just reading excerpts at the beginning, but then I, it got me to read the whole speech, and I said, "My God, this is this is MLK's." That's where he it merged civil rights and the peace movement. It's uh, and you see, it's filled filled with analysis, and you know has all the all the feels but it makes all the points about the Vietnamese and ask the question, why are we there? And why are we destroying this land for the Vietnamese? And then ironically, ultimately, here we are, 2023, and many of the Vietnamese who were caught in this, you know, decades of war, they are now here in America. They're American citizens. They are refugees. They came here in the 70s. And among them, Kihi, Kihi Kwan, who won a Golden Globe this week. So, you know, like I said, Martin Luther King's Asian American speech. You didn't think he had one. Yeah, he had one. When he was talking about the Vietnamese, they're Asian Americans now. This is, it's part of our Asian American legacy. Coming here, our stories coming here. Martin Luther King advocating, advocating for us. Asian Americans of the future. But like I said, something to think about. Something to think about for uh, MLK uh, weekend, right? You're going off, doing all sorts of things. Take some so time. Read, read it a paragraph at a time and say, God, that happened. Vietnam. Uh, I want to end one more time just uh, saying, you know, the whole thing about Kihi Kwan. What would turn me on about Kihi Kwan, you know, and this is the thing about actors, right? You, you get an opportunity, and then you think, is this it? And he says in his speech, is it, I, I'm not going to have another chance. I'm not going to have another opportunity. And he waited and waited and waited. And, you know, he, he was like, I think, 12. He was a young kid when he was did his stuff with Spielberg and also The Goonies with Richard Donner. But here he is. 51 winning a globe. So it had to be like two, three decades before he was able to do anything substantial. And he was actually working behind the scenes. He'd really kind of given up. But there's an inspirational lesson there to not give up. And then he said, I've heard him in subsequent interviews saying he had FOMO. He saw the crazy rich Asians. He saw that movie. And, you know, my line is, hey, I'm not a crazy rich Asian. I'm a crazy poor Asian. But, you know, 
I, I want to be in on that, that discovery of here are all the Asians. You know, Henry Golden was, I saw him. He was a presenter on the Golden Globes. I was wondering, who is this guy Golden with the, with the golden voice? Ah, Henry, you know, this is the thing. There's these Anglo-Asians. Michelle Yeoh is one of those two. But I like Michelle Yeoh. What a great actress. That was a great tandem night at the Globes with Kihi Kwan, Michelle Yeoh. And I draw inspiration from the both of them because I'm going to do my, uh, it's not acting. It's not acting when you're yourself, it, I, I, when you're not playing a character. I'm just being real, authentic, vulnerable, telling stories, more vulnerable than I am in my closet. Oops. <laughs> Gesticulating will get you in trouble if you bang the wrong thing with your hand. Uh, yeah. Uh, February 16th, 8, 10 p.m. in New York City. Then also the 18th, February 23rd, the 25th, the 26th, March 3rd, March March 4th. There are seven dates. Can't, can't miss me. Well, you can. But, I mean, all different times. I'll put it up on my website. The New York City Frigid Fringe, uh, check it out and try to get there. And if you can't, like I said, wherever you are, if you're in Hawaii, Philippines, California, just want to see it at home, there'll be live streaming options. There, there will. There really will. There really will. All right. Um, regular listeners of our show know, hey, you can catch us live 2 p.m. Pacific on uh, at Emil Muck on Twitter, Facebook, fb.com slash Emil Guillermo dot media on YouTube. Hey, you know, YouTube, hey, that's a good place to watch this at YouTube at Emil Muck one, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, the number one. And then, of course, we repeat the show on www.amok.com, amok.com, where you can get all the information about my shows Probably the, the big Frigid Fringe website hasn't been launched yet, but probably by this weekend. Probably by this weekend. Anyway, tell your friends, and um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm probably going to repeat this show Saturday and Sunday and Monday for the holiday because of the the King's speech that I read from. Just something to, you know, fast forward and you know, get to. Uh, really regular listeners of this show know that I like to end with a little meditation. Really, it's just taking it in, sitting back in your seat of awareness, you know, finding a place where you're breathing naturally, not labored. You can close your eyes. I like to open my eyes because then people can't tell. I'm meditating right now and you can't tell, but I, I am. And I'm standing. I'm not sitting. Huh. I, I, that's why I'm a stand-up meditator. And just notice the silence and the awareness of things around you and your thoughts. Ah, those are the tricky ones, the thoughts. Oh, here, there's a negative one. Oh, there's a positive one. Let that one through. Oh, there's a negative one. Stop that one. Stop. Bring out the Supremes. Stop in the name. Okay. That's how you do it. That way. Get those negative thoughts. Or you just allow them to go through, but just let them go through and don't let them dwell. Don't let the negativity dwell. Just let them go through. I mean, you're sitting back, noticing it all. Saying, oh, yeah, that, that's a judgment. That's a ju oh, that, that's an irrelevant judgment. It's not sticking. It's not real. And just let it go by. Because you're just aware. And then, before you go, give yourself a sense of loving kindness. 
offer it to yourself, but before you do, offer it to others. Offer it, induce an image of someone you know. Someone, maybe two people, one you care for, one you don't care for. You build up your strength. If you offer it to people you don't like, people you don't love. Boy, that's something. Boy, those people are really nice to me. They must really hate me. Yeah, they're just building up the, uh, the the muscle to be nice to everyone. And they it only builds if you you know go negative, if you go positive against negative people. So they must hate you a lot, Emil. I'm sorry. The way to build muscle. But really, offer offer love to other people first. It comes back. Twofold, threefold, fourfold. And so. As I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Emil Guillermo here. Back again. Oh, we'll probably repeat throughout the weekend. Maybe Monday I'll, I'll come back in. But have yourselves a good, long weekend. Till next time.